you know, coming to you live from World Championship in San Jose. Welcome to the Living Legends Podcast. If we're rolling, we can just go straight into it, yeah. We are rolling, yes. I have been recording for the last 33 minutes, and I will be cutting out at least 30 of those minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, without doubt. <laughs> and the, the people will never know what they missed. It was speaking of the people. Your Baldur's Gate MTG speak. It was mostly Baldur's Gate. <laughs> it was mostly <laughs> Baldur's Gate. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, welcome back to Living Legends Podcast. I'm your host for today. My name's Alice from Going Gaming and joined by some two lovely people as always. Let's go round the table. Let's go clockwise to Bill first of all. Oh, I'm clockwise. Okay. Um, yeah. I am, I am Bill. Call. Hello. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, this is another kind of episode where there's not like a ton of exciting uh, news to necessarily talk about, but... Uh, we will still find something to talk about. I think in general, it's just going to be sort of a main talking point from my from my understanding of of what we're going to be doing. So yeah, uh, yep. it'll still be a good discussion, but you know, we'll just kind of have to see how it goes. Um, yeah. And yeah, throwing it over to uh, last but certainly not least the uh, the video host of the of the yeah. Living Legends podcast, uh, Kel, also known as Red Zone Rogue. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Um... It's going pretty good, doing lots of stuff. Um, and uh, I think the topic today is going to be interesting as it does almost pertain directly to bright lights. Or at least the topic that I started to think about more after seeing the community reception to bright lights. I guess I could put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something yeah. that I, I think it was kind of expected given the nature of the set. If you've been living under a rock Bright Lights is the next Flesh and Blood set that we'll be releasing in a month or so. Uh, maybe more than that, like two months. Uh, and it is mm -hmm. an all-mechanologist set. So uh, we'll be talking about that. And we'll be talking about, uh, you know, pluses, minuses of both that and also Flesh and Blood's hero system as a whole. So That's right. Exactly that. Yeah. So the topic of today is basically pros and cons of the hero system as exactly what you said there because obviously in flesh and blood it's a hero centric game where you choose a hero and a class and obviously you build your deck around that hero using only cards from that hero's class um so what does that mean for what does that mean for sets what does that mean for things getting released like the new set that's coming out is all mechanologist so if you're a ranger player of course i'm always going to say this there's nothing in there for me unless it's going to be printed in the expansion slot. What's obviously going to be another thing that we can speak about and what we've alluded to on other podcasts as well. So yeah, that's going to be the main topic. And I've got a few a few uh, notes based on that as well, which we can go into. But do you want to start with our week in Flesh and Blood or week in general for card games? I know it's quite slow with regards to Flesh and Blood stuff. So... Kel, do you want to start with what you've been doing this week in general or fab related? If sure. Anything? I think Flesh and Blood right now is slow if you're not a competitive player. I think if you're a competitive grinder, it's not. It's like great because US or not just US nationals, all the nationals are going to be good, popping off um, soon. So if you're a competitive player, you're probably playing a lot of Flesh and Blood. You're probably diving into the meta and, uh, you know, learning all the ins and outs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but for everyone else, which is going to be most of the people out there, um, it's kind of a, a slower time. Maybe you're, you know, perusing the competitive scene. But um, for me, I've just been studying the competitive scene in preparation for doing coverage at U.S. Nationals. Um and yeah. other than that, how would you how how would you how would you do that then? Do you just like watch other streams and other str uh, streamers and stuff and get used to the language? And do you actually study decks that are relevant at the moment and stuff? Yeah, that's ba that's basically it. There's a couple of ways to do it. So one is uh, I make sure that I know every single card uh, that's relevant. Um, and I already have most of the cards in the game memorized. For me currently, it's just going through and memorizing the Dust Till Dawn stuff, especially like the more important Dust Till Dawn stuff. Stuff that I expect to see in uh, Vincent or Prism if they end up, you know, being good at all, I guess. Um, and then yeah. also it's uh, understanding what the top decks are, um, understanding how they function, how they play against uh, each other. I think knowing those gives you a good foundation. I think it's good to know more than that um, as much as possible, right? But like currently you got your Lexis, your Bravos, Dromai, um, Uzuri's actually up there at the top these days. Icelander, obviously. These are like the, the big 
you know, decks that you see uh, played. I obviously know Uzuri in and out, but uh, there's some other decks there that maybe have changed here and there that um, uh, I need to like uh, bone up on, as we said. Oh in the, yeah, in the last <laughs> look at that. That's gotten callback. There were a bunch of people commenting on how they're like, "I've never you, I've never heard the the term bone up used before." I'm like, I, I think that's, that's just a thing that's happened in North American uh, television uh, and, and movies, at least. I, I, I looked it up on like the Merriam Webster dictionary and I posted a reply to as in the comment section of the last <laughs> one with the dictionary thing. So it's a thing. I did not make it up. It is a thing and it's been around for a while. Um, but if it uh, exists in the Merriam dictionary, it's going to be a real thing. <laughs> of course. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, meh and yeet, I'm pretty sure, are part of the dictionary now. So <laughs> Absolutely. Oh uh, yes, yes, yes. But uh, yeah, yeats so, that yeats that fireball. I, I do, mm. I do use the word yeet quite a bit. But um, yeah, yeah. So to answer your question, to make it a little more succinct, yeah, I study up all the decks. I like to memorize the cards, and I do watch a little bit of coverage here or there. I don't have time to watch it all because I'm still pumping out videos and everything. But I do, I mm -hmm. do, do that. Uh, so I understand, like, you know, what to expect, how how these are playing out. Um, yeah. I, before uh, we go into before we go into Bill's sort of week and stuff, I know we've all been consuming a lot of Baldur's Gate three. I'm not sure how much discussion you heard about that before the podcast, if at all. Probably but we none. was we were <laughs> probably yeah, none. It's all gone. It's all gone. <laughs> you know, literally half an hour, forty five minutes of Baldur's <laughs> Gate three. Um, but yeah, but before we go into to Bill's stuff, if you've done anything this week, yeah, if you look at the snapshot, Brian Gottley posted, I think it was a retweet of Mid Max Games' is meta for the Battle Harden, which is happening at the moment, actually. Uh, as you as you were saying, yeah, you got Icelander, uh, so you got Lexi, 24 players, Bravo, 13 players, a lot of Bravo at the moment, Dromai, 13, Icelander, 11, and Azuri, 9. They're the top five represented in this event, the one that's happening at the moment. I, I think that's pretty representative of the overall meta right now. Just in general, these are the these yeah. are the heroes you see played the most, and you, these are the heroes you also see uh, get get in the top spots. That's not to say they're the only good heroes. Obviously, you know Dash is pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. Katsu's kind of made a resurgence. You have uh, Briar, but um, these are the ones that you predominantly see. So for me personally, like these are ones that I'm making sure I know the ins and outs of these heroes. I think the biggest one for me that I need to study up on is Leviah, um, because. I'll be honest, I really haven't played much Leviah. I can I can do dash games, Katsu games here, you know, left and right, but Leviah, I'm like, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Um <laughs> But uh yeah. yeah. That that's that. Oh, yeah, oh, oh cool. Sorry. I'll just say, yeah, the meta looks looks quite cool. Uh it's sad sad to say that Azalea is only one person playing in a field of 120 odd. Yeah, um, I, I tweeted about that. It it sucks to see her like pop off in outsiders and then like dust hold on drops and she's back down to like one one player yeah like, i want i wonder who that is as well it's i don't know where it's being held do you know do you know where that's being held uh mid max games battle hardened mm. i can't see it on this particular tweet it's actually not, mid max not, games it's not philadelphia is it it's somewhere in the chicago North, uh, so family owned business in northwest Chicago. So I wonder if that one player playing Azalea is Levi Roush. Obviously, one of the well, if not the best Azalea player. I hope it is. If you, I'd love to see what's going on there. But, um, but yeah, Arachne still zero, unfortunately. Prism and uh, and Vincent it's, are appearing a little bit. Uh, just to correct you a little bit, uh, that's where Min Max is located. This battle harden is in uh, Atlanta, just so you know. Oh, I see. Okay, mm. yeah. It's 100, 128 players for the Battle Hardened in Atlanta. Yeah. Not bad. Um, yeah. Sorry to cut you off, but I just wanted to. No, that's correct. right. Yeah. But yeah, it looks, looks, pretty, looks pretty cool. Nice little spread there. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what Flake and Armada report on with regards to the results there because they're casting it at the moment. Um, but yeah, going into Bill's week in Flesh and Blood card games. Anything? Anything? Um... Nothing crazy. I uh, <laughs> it is still <laughs> mostly Baldur's Gate. I yeah. did uh, very recently finalize, uh, or I guess not necessarily finalize, but uh, expressed interest and put on hold um, on three cold foil uh, Genesises, Genes Genesis, Gen Genesis. Oh, the armory stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I haven't really been uh, playing in events recently, but. Um, 
but yeah, somebody was uh, looking to sell theirs locally and they started it at like a hundred bucks and then uh, knocked it down to 90, then 80. And then they were like, okay, well, I'm going to sell it for 70. And if nobody takes, then I'm just going to sell it to one of our LGSs. And I was like, yeah, I'll buy it at 70. I think <laughs> I can do that. And so I said that and then somebody else chimed in because it was in our sort of public um, like trade channel in our Discord. And yeah. uh, and Grant actually chimed in and was like, I actually have like a bunch of them if you're looking for more. And I was like, oh. I, mean, I could be convinced to fill out the play set if you have two more. He said, I do. I'm like, well, easy sale. Well, the deal is done. <laughs> the deal is done. I... So um, the, Prism is still just I, I love everything about Prism. And I'm really it's really daunting. The, the concept of fully blinging out the deck because they just continue to print cold foil versions of the aura. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fancy <laughs> prism stuff um, for sure. Yeah, so um so yeah, might as well pick up on those while I can, especially if they're uh, competitively priced as these ones are. So thank you for uh for helping me out, my local friends. Hmm. Um and then the only other thing really is uh I played some uh some more commander on webcam. Um, oh, yeah. which I know is not flesh and blood related, but for flesh and blood related things, it was the first time I'd been to the um, to the Spike Feeder studio in a while. And uh, as a result, I had some things to pick up, mostly our preview cards, like the actual real physical preview cards that LSS has sent us for the last little while. I think there were three that um, had sort of been hanging out there. And then also, um, <laughs> this was just sitting in a pile of like random bulk. Uh, our cold foil diabolic offering nice <laughs> um, which when i told jim how expensive it was his eyes fell out of his head <laughs> 500 hundred dollar bill just sitting there man uh, yeah, just, like, just yeah. hanging out so uh yeah he gave me the option of um he's like well if you want to go through the legwork of selling it you can just put that towards um uh the barcelona trip um because i i still haven't booked my flight yet but i will um and uh he's like you could do that and i'm like well what if i just wanted to keep it he's like you can do that too that's fine whatever <laughs> yeah fantastic um, it's funny that uh you mentioned that you bought some flesh and blood because i actually did too i kind of almost forgot about it. i bought a case of outsiders from uh one of my Ooh. personal uh sponsors forge and fire and i was just like it's, it's still kind of cheap and also like it's i think it is just my favorite set and i'm like i don't have any sealed product of it I, I opened it all up so i was like you know i'll just mm -hmm. buy a case just kind of on a whim so i just bought a case uh, in addition to some other stuff in, in some of the other stuff being um some magic boxes actually i bought a about a about a box of jumpstart uh 20 Ooh. it's a newer one 2022 it's the newer one oh, okay yeah, um yeah. with the she's got this little little imp lady on the cover um and i'll, I'll be really quick about it too I've, I've been sort of getting back into magic in my own way i posted a video today at the time of the recording on my magic channel red zone mtg which had not had a video mm. posted to it for three months and then before that three years so um yeah yeah if, if, if you like magic <laughs> hey maybe go check out uh the the spike feeder stuff because bill it sounds like bill's gonna be uh doing some stuff and then um i'm doing precon content baby <laughs> maybe check out my my plucky little magic channel if you like it it's got like 1.4k uh. subs or something like that so i don't know whatever anyway yeah, yeah. Hey, if you're calling yourself Plucky, what the fuck am I? <laughs> uh, slightly larger than Plucky, because you got you got more you got more than 1.4k, right? No, no, I've i oh. my channel my channel hasn't grown in like a couple of months. <laughs> but it's, it's basically staying it's basically staying the same for, for okay. Yeah, my, you're I, at you're I, at 1.35. That's good. That's all right. It's um, it's, it's but, like basically neck and neck with Kells. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Hey, joke. what the, what the uh, hell, everyone? Go sub to Az's channel. I, th I thought he was like at least at like 2K <laughs> or something like that. Um, nah. Go go to nah. at, go to go again gaming, and then click the subscribe button, and then that yeah. makes oh, the cheers. that makes the I number go bigger. It. Makes the number go. He, like, he posts he posts Mimi content. If people don't like Mimi content, then what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I mean, it's fairly Mimi. Well, actually. That actually rolls really nicely into my week because Go Again Gaming is changing a lot. Like uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be changing a lot. There's going to be basically a lot more stuff on there, which isn't just fab related. Mainly fab related stuff, and I do have a daily fab series coming next mm -hmm. week. 
which is going to be fab content on the channel every single day until Worlds. So I'm going to reveal what that is uh, very soon. Um, but um, it also goes uh, neck and neck. with So it's flesh and blood related, but also health related as well. And it's going to be ah. every day until Worlds. So that's going to be an interesting series. It's also going to keep keep myself accountable for certain things on a daily basis. Um, so, uh, so yeah, watch out for that. But yeah, it's going to be changing uh, quite a lot. I'm just going to upload whatever I want with regards to whatever game I'm playing or stuff or product that I pick up. I'm just going to post about it and see what happens. If I lose subscribers, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm just doing this for the passion and the fun. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I'm just, I just thought I'd accept that of myself recently. I just want to post what I want to post without thinking too much about it. Um, Hell yeah, man. But, <laughs> I... So... Uh, I literally just finished an experiment on my channel where I posted a video every single day last week, but it was a different card game. Every so five five videos, uh, yeah. all different card games, and I figured I had some ideas, you know, in my mind what would happen. And yeah, that's basically what happened. YouTube kind of punishes you for doing different stuff. Um, yeah. And so the views were down in general. Uh, I think the only video that week that was like average or a little bit around that was the living legends podcast which was the only flesh and blood video that week um but normally my videos get at least a thousand views in the first couple days and i have multiple that don't even have that and the, the last time that happened was 11 months ago um it was the last time i put yeah. out a video and didn't get over a thousand views in the first couple days so like it does punish your channel but i will tell you this the views are down but i did get I think more subs than normal because I think people from those other games ended up um, subbing to the channel. So it's not yeah, something exactly. I'm, it's not something yeah. I'm gonna do all the time. No, I'm not gonna do like five different games every single week. It was kind of an <laughs> experiment, but uh, yeah. Anyway, just gonna yeah, giving you some. It's not really advice, just a heads up on what to expect, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. But I love the chaos. I love wading through it. You know, you know. Remember when uh, we had the. Um... The uh, the la later spoiler season and Alex dropped the spoilers on us. What a few days before we're supposed to spoil it, and we had to try <laughs> yeah. and figure out. <laughs> we had to try and figure out what was going on. I was like, "Yes, let's go. Let's make something for it." Oh man, that <laughs> fun times. You know, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but man, I worked so hard on that video, and it also like didn't do as good as like most of my other spoiler videos, and so I spent like yeah. crammed in like forty to fifty hours editing that thing, and it did like fine like it did like normal video fine i think it has like two thousand views or something like that maybe maybe a little bit more i'll go check but it didn't do as much as like some of my other preview videos and the the amount of effort i put in last minute was disproportionate to how well it did still fun yeah uh it just i just kind of proud felt of it like but. preview season this past time for for dusk till dawn and i know the reasons why it happened like there was a whole sort of debriefing that that alex sent out um after the fact yeah. and it was largely due to um i think he he had mentioned that um he was taking on sort of more responsibility and there was just a lot of more there was a lot more things to to organize at the same time but also the other main thing and i think this is probably the most um the most pressing part was um that there were leaks in outsiders and they wanted to try to avoid that yeah. as much as possible um which again like definitely totally understand um but yeah it really affects uh i think it just affects people's ability to like start to drum up hype for their cards because it's one thing to be a content creator and know that you've been invited to be part of the, um, the preview season. But if you don't know what your card is, then at least for me, it was kind of hard to be like, Oh, Hey, like we're going to do a cool thing. Like, I know there were some people that were like sprinkling in, um, like different parts of their card where it's like, Oh, this is, you know, um, it yeah, has this fine. word in its flavor text and stuff like that, like leading up to the reveal of their card. And you just kind of can't do that if you don't know what your card is. So I think it just really stifled um, people's ability to to do that sort of pre like the lead up to the actual reveal. So I don't know. It does seem again, I, I very recently reread through the email. It does seem like Alex is um, hoping to be able to push things out a little bit further in advance. Um, but yeah, I guess I it's harder. Yeah, I guess it's harder to give people that sort of stuff if you're not spoiling a 
ridiculously good card because I, I had the same thing in that set. I had a, a common card, a yellow version of a common card, and how much can you really hype that up? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I think that I also think plays into it. yeah, because Ethan had the via, and obviously he knew about that, and he could he could post certain things like the via comma, like just to he... just to give so much, just to give loads of loads of like. Hype essentially, and <laughs> let's be real up. though. He he had the big card of the set. Like he had the most exciting card oh, yeah. to reveal. Not only was it a hero, but it was like a new card type. It was like the yeah. hero he's known for. Like he got the slam dunk on that one. Like well, he I mean, got yeah. he got hooked up. And yeah. and in that sort of vein as well, um, like your reveal as for outsiders. Um, you yeah, have like one of the three quivers, which again is sort of yeah. in that same category of like this is a new card type. This is unprecedented. Well, exactly, um, yeah, because because me and me and Jim did the whole pre-video to the video as well, which was which was you know the whole skit of the the ringing he him ringing me up in the middle of the night when I was asleep, sort of thing. <laughs> you know that I, I thought that was perhaps the best video thing I've ever done with Jim. I thought I was great. Um, but that, that, that's what I mean. If you, if you have that, so, that, that sort of card, I guess you can do the extra, the extra work. But if you don't, it's hard to really do anything for it, you know? Like extra pre-hype hype, essentially. Yeah, and spoiler season is always like a... Hmm, how do I put it? It has an interesting cadence to it because, like, I think... Some videos will iner- inherently just get way, way more views and just more exciting than than like others. Yeah. Um. Even if you have like a legendary, I don't think that really guarantees your video is going to get a bunch of views because I have seen right. some like people put out legendary spoilers and their videos get like a couple hundred views or something. And I'm not knocking their video or or whatever. I'm just saying that uh, inherently certain things won't. I think heroes always will though. Like if you have a he- if you have a yeah. new hero. Oh, yeah. People want to see the new hero, like so. Like uh, my my Uzuri one is probably the most viewed spoiler video I have. It's not the most viewed flesh and blood video I have, because I think my Uzuri video I just looked it up. It has uh, eight thousand going on eight eight point something thousand. Uh, but I have flesh and blood videos that have like twenty thousand to fifty thousand, maybe. Maybe I'm thinking about a different video. But anyway, um. Mm. Yeah, so it's like it's like interesting going from Uzuri to like Nazareth, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. It's a new demon, and the Nazareth video did fine. <laughs> it's like three, three, three k views, but like that's the amount of time I spent on that. I'll tell you what, like that video has three k views. You know what it has more than that? Um, my Shadowverse Evolve starter deck opening re- and review has three point eight k, and I'll tell you, I spent a lot less time on that than I did learning to like edit like well not just learning to edit but just like oh, editing animations all the yeah. animations i have like the music in it and the, like I, I try to sync things up to the music video like to make it more like a music video uh yeah so like i do it because i love it i love flesh and blood and i want to make something cool for the community but damn like the cost to return <laughs> really is not great um yeah uh so yeah, I think it's, actually, all, it's all good fun, but I was gonna say yeah. I think my my grand archive spoiler has almost almost the same amount of views. Anyway, um, for <laughs> they gave me Uther, uh, the king. Anyway, how do we how do we even get onto the topic of spoiler cards? I can't remember. I don't it's know. Proper we're... loose, isn't it? Well, that, that's what we need for this episode because uh, we don't really. Yeah. Know what we're doing. We're... Uh, no, exactly. We, we've we figured out how to have a discussion, and there that's the important did. thing. Oh, um, we figured out how to talk. What a great day! <laughs> um, it was it was so much to do with my week in my week in Fab. I didn't hadn't really wrapped up, and oh. suddenly it went to went to that. Um, but yeah, oh, uh, yeah. Last... it was it was me mentioning that I had grabbed our spoiler cards mm. from uh, mm. Studio. That's it. Pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah but anyway. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, that's that's pretty much the the week in Fab. I did have another video come out recently, which was which was. Uh, what are my my thoughts on why I think trading and collecting is so good in Fab? Um, loads of reasons as to why you can. Be, we basically touched on it last episode with uh, the fact that I had acquired a red and the ledger mat for selling a cold four that I didn't want, 
just transferable assets, really. It's just a great thing about this game. Uh, so I did a video on that. Uh, but the main topic of today's podcast is the sort of, uh, as we alluded to earlier, the pros and cons of the hero system. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously in Flesh and Bud, you choose a hero, you build a deck around that hero, but you can only use cards of that class. So if you gravitate to a certain hero, like I do, for instance, like we all do, Kel Assassin, Bill Illusionist, me Ranger, Kel Ranger as well, um, it just means that when sets roll around and you don't have the hero support that you might want, especially if it's supplementary, what can you really do with that product and all of that other stuff? So where is a good place to start? Do you have any points to start off? I, I do have a few, but uh, any sort of first thoughts straight away? I Structurally, to structure the conversation, I think it'd be good to start about, start talking about the positives of it and like why it's yep. good. And then we can talk about like why maybe, uh, I don't want to say it's not good, but why some of the negatives of it. Um, because I think yeah, I yeah. think I think we can talk more about the the negatives of it than the positives. Because I think the positives are pretty obvious, um, and I think that'll make that yeah. that that part of the conversation a little quicker. And I think the positives are obvious, right? Uh, you find mm -hmm. something that you resonate with, and you can like really put yourself into it. And you're like, I'm a, a ranger player. I'm an assassin player. Or you can even go deeper into that. I'm an Uzuri player. I'm uh, an Azalea player, right? And you can just really relate to the character, just really love the character or whatever, and be diehard yeah. for that. Um, and I think that's one of Flesh and Blood's biggest strengths, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I, think that's, I, think that, I think that I think the hero system is the most, the, 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 the best thing for retaining people because they're identifying with that hero, aren't they? And they're just essentially waiting for support for that character. So when something comes up, they're like, oh, yes, finally, you know, I get to do this. And, you know, you still want to play your deck even at high level events when the meta isn't really in your favor, you still want to play that hero because that's the hero you like. That's the hero you want to play. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely one of the one of the strongest points, and that's the whole reason why I got into it. Coming from a commander background, where you choose a commander to play in Magic, yeah. and you build your deck around that co that creature or whatever, Flesh and Blood does that straight away. So yeah, it's definitely a good a good tool for that. Yeah, I'm going to liken this to another card game, an old dead card game. Might be coming back. I don't know. That's a whole other thing. But Legend of the Five Rings. And so in Legend of the Five Rings, you had these clans, right? They're all like mm -hmm. um, feudalistic Japan-themed clans set in this uh, uh, fictional world in, in Rokugan. And uh, there's a bunch of different clans. And it, it works similar to the way Flesh and Blood class system works in that uh, you play as a clan. There's a little bit of mixing, but not not a ton. Usually, if you're if you are playing Crane, then you are a Crane clan player. If you are a Crab player, like if you play Crab, you are a Crab clan player. Same for Scorpion, Dragon, all of them. There's a bunch of different clans. Uh, spider, which is a nod, by the way. I'm pretty sure it's a the spider in Flesh and Blood is a direct nod to the spider clan in uh, Legend of the Five Rings. But wow, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think I think it is. Um, they're <laughs> like they're like assassins. Um, in oh, in, in all five R. Yeah. Um, so I I think this is a problem that L five R had too. Um, where people are like, I'm all in on my clan. When I've made videos about this game before, I always ask like. Which clan are you? And then I think that gets a lot of people engaged because they're like, oh, I played this clan. I played Phoenix. I played whatever. Um, mm. But the same things happen in that game and we're seeing it happen in Flesh and Blood where they can't put every clan in every single set because the sets would be a mess. Um, so what it, what it does is you have a set that has like three clans in it, right? You're like, oh, this is the, the unicorn, dragon, and mantis set. And if you don't care about those clans, then you're like... I don't need yeah. the set. I don't need. I mean, I can buy the generic cards or maybe one card here or there, but for the most part, you're like, I'm out. Um, so I think that's yeah, that's and gonna I, be a big part of it. Like recently, it's uh, also quite relevant because Dust Till Dawn was one of these sets where there was no support for my favorite characters. Um, whereas in the, in the past, <laughs> supplementary sets had a bit of everything. You got you got inverse support as an Azalea. I fan. got inverse. Yeah, you, you right, got you got Warmonger's diplomacy. That's what you got. Um, <laughs> yeah. See, I can you know ra Rangers can use Warmongers. You know they can include it in their decks because it's yeah. a generic. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> you can. So hey, all you heroes can, can have it. You can play Poison the Well, and so you can tech against all those cleric players. Um, I can. 
yeah, so whenever they gain life, they lose that much life instead, which can be good in those sort of life gain matchups. Get wrecked, bolt um, in, play it on his Lumina turn, make him lose life every time he gains life. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but um, it's exactly what you said. Like, for, for Dust Hold On, for me, um, I want to play all the characters, I want to play all the, the decks and stuff, but like for the decks that I actually maintain and play, like Uzuri, I got, I got two cards. I got Warmongers and I got Sensor. Um, and I bought yeah. those, and uh, <laughs> I still have yet to build Prism or Vincent because I'm just like, mm, maybe I will. Hold on a sec. Hold on a minute. Sensor. What does Sensor? What does Sensor do again? It's a one for five. Blocks three, and then it says uh, when it hits a hero, you choose a card name, and then your opponent cannot play that card on the next turn. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. So, so the if I so, so if I played this in Azalea and said could. Warmongers. Yeah, you could. I yeah, could, I could. I could play this in Azalea and chuck this at them and say Warmongers. You won't be able to do that if you, if this hits you. Maybe force a block. Maybe could. that's crap, crap tech, crap, crap idea. Let me know in the comments below. You could. But it's just a way of chains of eminence. Use that in Azalea decks. Let's go. Yeah, you, you just can't do, play Warmongers. Just, just do chains of eminence. <laughs> what I what I really like, by the way, this is what it, it would be kind of interesting in Azalea in, in this particular way is uh, I don't want to talk too much about sensor, but. Um, I love it with Codex of Frailty because your opponent, you force them to discard a card and they have to get an attack action card from their graveyard, put it in their arsenal. They have to say what that oh, card yeah. is. They have to tell you what that is because uh, it has to be an attack action card. And then you pick Sensor, put Sensor into your arsenal, and then you hit them with Sensor. Uh, now they have one less card to block with, making it more likely to hit. And then you just name the card that they just put into their arsenal. So now they cannot right. play that card. So their arsenal is stuck for a whole turn. They can't do anything with it because they can't play it unless they have some way to, you know, weird way to clear it out, like a Skullbone Crossroad or something like that. But, um, yeah, it's great. And you're like, haha, suck it. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I, I Codex of Frailty, and now you also have a Frailty token, too. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. It's it's sweet. Sensor's cool. I like yeah. it. Anyway. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But well, the the generics from Dusk Till Dawn were generally quite powerful. <laughs> Pretty good. Yes. Yeah. Um, were indeed. <laughs> and so Bill, I guess what what are your opinions on the whole like I guess the positives for the class system. We're talking about the positives. What what, what are the positives for the class system? It's again the the thing that to me really sticks out when people start referring to just the way that um flesh and blood is structured is um the ability like kel was kind of saying um the ability for somebody to latch on to a specific hero or at least a class and be like yeah i'm a rune blade player i'm a you know if you want to get more specific i am a chain player i like shadow rune blade i like chain specifically um i think that that's yeah. just a really strong way to keep people invested in the game. And I think that it's kind of like a situation where you can't have good without bad. Um, you can't have um, light without dark sort of deal where um, it does kind of suck when these sets come out where it's set, um, support for a specific hero or specific set of heroes. And, um, you know, that was the complaint for the longest time for a uh, mechanologist for even Ninja up until a little while ago. Yeah. Um, Ninja was kind of on the back burner for a while until they got a bunch of um, support all in a row. So it's it's kind of tough because with as many heroes as there are, it's not reasonable for there to be a, like sets consistently all in a row that have a, the same amount of support for every hero. So it's kind of more of just a feature of how flesh and blood is structured and while it does impact the way that people can um can engage with it in some ways i think it also allows for stuff like this where um i think i had mentioned this in last week's or the week before is but uh, bright lights is great because it's been so long since mechanologist had any amount of time in the limelight <laughs> that yes, now yeah. all of a sudden they're just getting a full like 200 and 80 card set or however many cards are in the set like all the basically all the stuff is for them outside of whatever is getting um put in the expansion slot um so it's like a payoff for them specifically and they've oh. earned it at this point 
just just before we just before we lose that thread, one of my points is along those lines. So I'm just going to mm-hmm. put throw this in the ring now. So yeah. in the future and in the present, because obviously we're getting this set now, when we have more extensive card pools for all classes, will we see inherent power creep or new ways to play that mm-hmm. hero? Because obviously, because we're getting a shitload of cards for Mechanologist. So that can potentially open up five, four or five different ways to play Mechanologist. Because we've got the Evos, mm. we've got the... We've got, we got loads of the other... We haven't even seen half of the set yet. We haven't even seen, even seen any of the set, uh, any of the set mm. yet. But there, there's, there's already two, play, two ways to play Dash. You can do Pistol or you can do Boost. There's an argument maybe for a hybrid version or some other version. And now Mechanologist... It's not even a talented thing. It's just mechanologists in general is going to be able to turn up to a a meta game or a tournament, and nobody's going to know what version of mechanologists you're playing. So, to to what end does you know does that does that stop later on down the line in a couple of years? We're going to be able to sit across the table from a dash and be like, okay, there's ten versions of dash that could potentially be played here. <laughs> yeah. There's Evos, there's Pistol, there's Boost, there's Gundam, there's Space Dash, there's Cosmological Dash, there's Timekeeper Dash. <laughs> so Timekeeper dash. you know, I think that's great. You though. know what 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 ha- it is great, and they're all there's always going to be a best deck in, in the format, isn't there? There's always going to be Probably. a way. There's always going to be a way for someone to figure out. Oh yeah, this is the best amount of cards or do metas really sort of build themselves out of the cards that are available but it's a non-rotating format so how does that look in the future so it's a quite a lot to unpack there but i thought it was a good point based on what what was being said so i do want to shed a little bit of light on 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 bright lights uh pun definitely intended so they did say in the product uh info release that there are i believe three distinct uh, archetypes, I guess you can call them, yeah. in bright lights, yeah. and they correspond to the three heroes in the set. Because uh, we know there are three heroes in the set. We know two of them already. We know Dash, Teklavazin. We know what Teklavazin does. We don't know what Dash does yet. And we there's a third unannounced hero, or unspoiled yeah. hero. So we do know there are three, at least three distinct archetypes in bright lights specifically. Um, yeah. And then... Um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I imagine uh, that dashes is probably going to be boost matters in some capacity or um, boost slash items, because that's kind of what she's already done, just expanding on that. But yeah, we do know that Tech Levasin is Iron Man, which I think is going to be really yeah, cool. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> He's a big old, big old Gundam, <laughs> built some Avas. Um... I am Tech Levasin. <laughs> <laughs> um... uh... I think it's a good thing to have a bunch of different uh, archetypes and ways to play. I think about any, or maybe maybe the best example here would, would be Magic the Gathering. I know some of the folks out there who are listening to this have never played Magic before, um, but I know a lot of folks have. And in Magic, uh, you just have five colors, right? And it's just just, just the five colors. There's like uh, mixes of the colors. There's artifacts, which are, there's, there's colorless stuff. But essentially, there's five colors. And each of the colors does a few things well better than the other colors and if you want to play like a blue deck that means so many things in magic like there are so many blue decks and i think we're going to get to the point in flesh and blood where that's extrapolated you know out to the myriad of classes but it's going to be like Mm -hmm. you're going to play a mech but it's going to be like so different so many different kinds of mechs and the way you play mech is going to differ between the way someone else plays mech obviously like as said there is probably going to be the most optimal tournament viable way there could be multiple ones for for mech right there could be like here's the control mech here's the aggro mech um that that kind of stuff but uh i think just having more options is just great for card games in general and it makes it so people can play um the way they want to play which is either competitively or if they want to make a jank I don't know, jank mid-range dash where you just build robots, then yeah, go for it. Or maybe maybe robots is the competitive way. I don't know. But um Yeah. Uh, like and it. it's is it is it that's an interesting point as well, because um I was literally uh very, very side quick side tangent. I bought a couple of D D books today. One oh, of them was the go. Yeah. Well, well one of them was the Monsters Monsters of the Multiverse book. That's a pretty good one. You got have you got that one? Uh 
to to spoil it, I have almost every single D D book they've ever made. For I could five. see you grabbing them. I could see you going. Well, for well it, the, so. these are just the ones that I have for our D and D session. Which, by the way, at the time of this recording, or the time Good that you're wa- you're watching this, will will have pub like premiered on Monday. So you should go, you should go watch this. But anyway, oh, yeah. of course, um, yeah. I have almost all the D&D books. Sometimes they double up on content, so I don't buy the double up on content. Uh, like, they, they'll put, like, they'll, like, smash a bunch of books together and make, like, one book. And I'm like, I don't need to buy it again. But anyway. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, so the the Monsters of the Multiverse book basically is another expansion which sort of adds more monsters to the game and stuff. And I was watching a video about it before I bought it, and the designer of it was basically saying that... In the old race system, you know, obviously in D and D, you choose human, tiefling, whatever. What players would normally do is, if they're going to play a rogue, what what race would you play if you was a rogue? Well, I play whatever I want because I'm a, a, a based D and D player. But if you want to min max, you pick the one that has the, um, the 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 racial bonus for like uh, agility, dexterity, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you yeah. get the one that has like and the that's plus, exactly plus two decks or whatever, like an elf, high elf, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. Because uh, in this new version, I think they've changed the rules where all race bonuses are gone. Yeah. So it just it just means that people can play the race that they want to play, but then they add their stats or or something else, or they choose their stats later on. I don't know the full mechanics of it. Someone correct us in the comments if you know any uh, any more details. But this is this is the same thing where all these classes you're going to have different ways to play them as well. Um, so what I was getting at was uh, variants. Uh, there was a, there was a podcast recently uh, on Arsenal Pass where Brian was on there, and they asked a, they asked a question about variants because this could add a lot of variants to Flesh and Blood in the future. Because if you've got if you sit across the table from a hero that has six ways of playing how do you sideboard against that if you don't know what what, what version they're playing against because mm-hmm. that adds lo- that adds loads of variance then doesn't it it's if you've got s- six versions of dash and they're playing oh i'm gonna, I'm gonna sideboard against the pistol version because uh, that's probably what's going to be prevalent in the meta and then they that, turn up with evo gundam dash and then you're like shit well i mean that's the risk you play when you when you go into a tournament that you run into the rogue deck um but I mean, this is the yeah. same for this is the same for Magic, right? Like for Legacy or Modern, there's a bunch of different decks. But you basically tech your sideboard against what your deck is weakest against, and or what you think is going to be the most prevalent in the meta to give you the best possible chance to beat that deck. Um, yeah, that's just how it works. Like there could be a crap load of different decks, but I, I imagine Flesh and Blood will be like that. Um, if not already, like that's how it'll end up being. Like so, instead of being like yeah. I tech I tech against Mac, it'll be like I tech against this specific version of Mac, right? Which yeah, like which my, you my, think my is... deck folds to to pistol <laughs> specific <laughs> yeah. pistol strategies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so yeah, I just wanted to highlight that point while we're on it because uh it is gonna inevitably get to that point where we're gonna have different versions of different heroes turning up. Uh, and ultimately there will be there will there will yes be a meta game and things that you can expect to run into because either that's the new hotness or you just inherently know the value of the cards for that class or whatever are going to be generally just better than anything else um but i think that's good that it leaves room for these rogue decks in the future and um kind of building on that something that i really appreciate that lss has already Ruben is um, sort of a way that they um, design when it comes to having these expansion sets. They've they've done it before, and I'm absolutely positive they'll do it again. Is putting focus on uh, alternate strategies, like you're mm. saying there, uh, as with like mm. having different types of playstyles for the same hero. Like we have the makings of um, like Big Axe Dorinthia, which I think people yeah. have already started playing with. Um, but like we got Some that. Adore, back yeah. in, back in monarch um where they finally pr- they printed spill blood which is like the craziest axe support card of all time <laughs> um and yeah. uh yeah they they did it um even recently i think with the most recent support set which was which one was that not outsiders i mean not dynasty. dynasty uh dust till dawn, dynasty? Dust till dawn yeah. is technically the most recent one but the one before that was dynasty yeah, the, yeah, they did the loads of random that. stuff in that set, didn't they? Loads yeah, of random there was stuff. Like, oh, yeah, there was support for archetypes that just 
didn't exist then and still kind of don't now but Tigers? that's it's yeah. something that they're consistently yeah. trying to do is just keep printing stuff for side grades and not necessarily upgrades i like that um, I, mean, I mean i like that design philosophy yeah. just in general but yeah, yeah i i really appreciate it i think that it's a really um healthy way to go about printing new cards for for this game so i think with that in mind with their sort of proven track record i think that bright lights is going to be really cool for expanding um mechanologist as a class into just hmm. a bunch of different things uh, pulling it in a bunch of different directions before yeah. we get to potential negatives uh i want to pose po possibly as devil's advocate i want to i want to pose a question to you guys um obviously it's not fun when you get a set that doesn't have support for the only you know class or hero that you play right obviously you're, you're pretty bummed out about that i think we can all agree that like that's not a good feeling yeah. thing but is mm -hmm. it a consumer friendly thing to be able to say no i don't need to buy this set i can pass like is that a good thing to some degree where you can be like as the consumer not as lss obviously as lss it is not great to have parts of your fan base just skip on your product entirely that's obviously not a great thing but as a consumer is it good to be like nope i don't need to buy this like if dust hold, if like literally for dust hold on if you only wanted the generics you could just be like buy the generics that's it and then just skip mm -hmm. on the set uh so i'm gonna pose that to you guys um what do you think on that front I do think that that's it, it is a, a relevant concern to have, um, like you say, just from a consumer standpoint and from a, a company standpoint, because at the end of the day, companies are still companies. They're, they're here to make money. They're here to make a product yeah. um, that ends up being sold. But um, based on my experience with other not even just games, just hobbies in general. Um, it can be really alienating to have a hobby that um, you have to consistently spend money on to keep up with. Um, and it's it's kind of hit or miss whether or not that actually like makes its way through to how your consumers are actually uh, interacting with your product. But I think that with Flesh and Blood's current release schedule, it is maybe more of a detriment to have these if they were to get closer to like something like i don't want them to get all of this way but like too closer to a Yu-Gi-Oh schedule or a magic the gathering schedule where they're consistently putting out stuff i think that it becomes a lot less noticeable when sets like this happen where there's only yeah you know there's a set for one specific set uh of, or there's one specific class or color or archetype or whatever you want to call it um it becomes a lot less noticeable but with this because we're only getting four sets a year um i think actually we're only getting three right now right Currently, the, the yeah, four i think three. is yeah the four is um is at some point we will be getting there um as sort of devil's advocate it is a lot more noticeable when uh a full third of the releases that are coming out this year are stuff that you have to skip um Could and be that more only than gets that, worse yeah, it only gets worse if there are two in a row or if it's all three in the year, like you go a full year without getting actual support for your um, class like that. Again, that can be pretty alienating. Um, it is nice to be able to skip it when there's a more frequent release schedule, because then it allows you to sort of go harder on the stuff that really matters to you. But yeah, it's it's a tough balance to hit. I think it will become less noticeable as Flesh and Blood pumps up their release schedule. But as for right now, I can see where people are coming from. I have a um, that it kind of feels bad. <laughs> I have a quick follow up mm -hmm. to that that I'm going to ask you as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think focusing more on limited changes that at all? Um, Absolutely. I'm I'm not <laughs> as much of a limited player, so I'll I'll defer to As for that one because it sounds like you have a, a much stronger um, uh, opinion about it right out the gate at least. <laughs> but yeah, for me, I'm not I'm not really I've never really been interested in in limited as a format, so um yeah my opinion yeah. kind of stays the same but in general um as what do you what do you think yeah so 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 limited is a great way to potentially introduce people that are one trick ponies or one trick heroes to other things 
because if there's a set there's a set that comes out you still want to you know you still like this game you still love how it plays and all this and you still want to explore the new set but you don't necessarily want to jump right in the new system like crack shuffle play if that can be present in all sets going forward i don't know how they would do it but yeah. if that can be the benchmark you know that could be the best way to introduce people to play potentially other heroes and still engage with the set and then potentially still pull chase cards this is a point that i made in my collector's video you go to these things you pull the chase card and suddenly that chase card can then turn into something you actually want whether it's a card for your deck for your hero or whether it's a banner in the background in, in your studio or whatever you know it still encourages you to go to these things you can still pull the chase card still trade it or collect it uh, or whatever but i think it's uh, i think yeah i think limited is a is a great gateway to many positive things um even if you don't play the the certain class that's in the set yeah i agree with that that's a that's a really good point actually is um having those situations where yeah you just go out to an event to celebrate the release of a new set and you pull a chase card and you're like okay cool now i can buy all these upgrades for my real deck that i wanted that yeah. i care about because this card that i pulled doesn't necessarily matter to me but it matters to other people so yeah being able yeah, to sort exactly. of translate that is is really strong yeah i actually used yeah. to know people in magic this is a long time ago well before like 2019 and COVID and everything and well before magic did different booster types set boosters collectors this is back when you had one box and you could draft with the box i knew people who literally only played limited and they would show up at the lgs play uh -huh. play limited and then immediately sell every single card that they just got back just so they could play limited again that's all they did yeah like they did not they never kept a single card um yeah just going infinite <laughs> yeah or, or trying to at least um so like yeah i agree i think limited is really big and i think that's you know very likely one of the reasons why it sounds like flesh and blood lss they want to focus more on limited and less on like the supplemental sets um or the expansion sets uh because expansion sets are nice they're, they're they're cool to like upgrade your uh constructed decks but if they're you know we, we just had dust till dawn and dust till dawn is an expansion set that i think a lot of people could skip on like un unless you're playing light shadow or any of the four classes in there you just buy like your three warmongers and you're good like yeah that's that, what i mean it's it. like if you're not connected to the set you just yeah, you just like oh, okay. What's the next thing then? That's like sim similar to what I what what I was doing, but I did enjoy. I, well, I, he, you dust till dawn. You can't do it. You can't play. You have to play with monarch sealed. We tried. We the our yeah. game store played monarch sealed plus whatever you've got in your dust till dawn packs uh, mm. draft, which was an interesting thing to do because it did fit fit in with the the flavor of monarch. But if you can't play with the cards at a pre release, then how do you do a pre release? You know, it's something that they have to think of proactively every single time they do a supplementary set if it needs to piggyback off of the off of another one that they've already done. Like, um, I don't have it here. Grand Archive does it in a really cool way that I think no other card game, well, maybe some other card games kind of do something similar to this. Um, in that, so they have, the way that it works currently in Grand Archive is they have one set and then they have another set that directly supplements that first set. Um, and so what they do for the, the second, like for the supplemental set, is they have a product, a sealed kit that comes with a seeded pack of, you know, specific cards, one of all the champions and then some generic cards that you can put into whatever deck. And, and then you have, uh, I don't remember how many packs, so let's just say three or four of the first set and then three or four of the second set. And you play sealed by mixing them all together because the second set was designed to be played with the first one. And so now you have a really... Yeah fun sealed experience with the new cards and also with some of the old cards too, the previous set, but it's a way to make a supplemental set work um, in a limited environment. And I think they're doing that in a very smart way. And they, they come in these nice little sealed boxes, kind of like magic pre-release yeah. kits sort of, but it's like, it's like, a, it's like a magic pre-release kit. If you mash it up with a previous set as well, um, mm -hmm. that's kind of what it's like. I think it's really smart. That is that is something that I'm I do miss about um, new set releases for uh, Magic: The Gathering. That I think that Flesh and Blood might be able to adopt at some point. I think that it actually like works pretty well, having um, a set where there's a bunch of different types of um, support, or it's like mostly a generic set or whatever. Um, being able to go to an event and be like, oh hey, like which of these seated 
um, like sets would you want? Like, do you want the warrior pack or do you want the brute pack or whatever? Yeah. And having, yeah, that seeded pack with a couple of brute cards or a couple of warrior cards that supplement what you can pull, um, I think is also really cool. It, it does play in, of course, to the like, what do you align with sort of deal? But yeah. uh, it was something that I liked and that I think would fit in pretty seamlessly with with flesh and blood as a whole at least like in one facet or another yeah yeah for, yeah. for magic it was like hit and miss because i remember the last one of the yeah. last times i went to a pre-release this is a long time ago uh was tarkir block so it was like cons of tarkir and i remember like opening it opening it up and you got a random clan or whatever whatever they're called and so it's just like well, if you opened it up and your little seated thing was like the teamer one, guess what? You're probably going to be playing teamer now because you have a lot of like teamer cards. Yeah. And so it was kind of like, uh, it took away a little bit of like yeah. the player agency. Um, I'm not sure how they work now. I haven't played uh, in a Magic pre-release in over three years, but um, yeah, I think uh, yeah. the last one that I went to that had an actual set like that was um, Theros. The, the one that was like Greek inspired. The original and Theros? I remember, like, that's a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, like, like OG Theros. That's a while. And, I, I lived uh, in California. That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. Um, I'm still in my 20s. Ugh. But yeah, no, that was, I think with that one, my, my sealed, uh, my seeded pack for all of my like cool rares were all off color to all of the stuff that I pulled in my packs. Yeah. So I had to like make a yeah. deck that was even remotely passable with the cards that I pulled. It sucked. And so I tried to make a really bad version with the seeded rares that I got. And it also sucked. There was just no overlap. So yeah, it is definitely hit and miss. I, um, I remember doing pretty good at my Tarkir one. I, I pulled a, what people colloquially called Big Nucks. Uh, Savage Knuckle Blade. Oh yeah, Savage I got, I, Knuckle Blade. I got a big Nux, and uh, he he's pretty good. <laughs> uh, three. Uh, well, by current standards, he's probably like poop, poopy stats. But he was a he was a three mana four four with like three abilities. He was cool. Big Nux. Yeah, but, he was neato. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, well, I think we're I, th I think we're uh, I think we're sort of kind of touching on negatives to a certain degree. So I've got another another mm. point we we can yeah. throw in here. Let's do it. Um for for negatives and that's banning cards for certain mm. classes that are not the main offenders of the card. Bullseye braces for instance, right? Mm. Why why was Bullseye braces banned? Uh because Le Brian because Gottlieb Lexi. because Brian Gottlieb <laughs> hates hates you specifically. <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so yeah, well, well, let me speak about banning cards. If you ban a card for, let's say, Lexi, it affects the other rangers. It affects Riptide and Azalea as a result of that because you're banning a card universally for that class. So I had an argument uh, with myself over this. Um, <laughs> and I, th I, I thought, what, 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 about, what, what about the idea of banned in X? So if so, bullseye mm. braces. It's banned in Lexi, not banned in anything else. Is that a good idea? Because you know it's the same reason why certain things like stubbies were banned because Phi was the abuser of it. Um, there, there there might not be as many cases to really pull upon, really. But that's the thing I've I've been I feel the most with the bullseye ban is because Lexi was the main offender, not Azalea, and now Azalea cannot use it. She doesn't have the AB who on field she can't put something into our arsenal anymore like she used to be able to do so those lines are just erased they're thanos snapped because of lexi essentially mm -hmm. yeah lexi still is the most represented hero at the and event exactly, that we're just talking exactly. about yeah um personally i think it sounds good on paper but i think it's a little fiddly i think it's like a little muddy um to, so if, if you have one instance here, here's, here's my thoughts if you have one instance of that it's probably fine if you're like, okay, Bullseye Bracers, Band and Lexi. But what happens mm. when you have a list of 20 of those cards? You have, um, you know, Crippling Crush, Band in Bravo, Star of the Show 2, but not in First Bravo. And then you have, you know, this card banned in this hero, but not this other hero. And then you have like that, but like 20 of them. And so when you're building a deck, you're like, what the hell is even legal in my deck? Like, then you have to like consult the list and be like okay is this legal in the deck and then you have to check like 
you have to check the CC list and you have to check the list for your specific hero. Like it's just one more thing that makes it fiddly for like non super entrenched players to like make something um, and have fun with it. Which is unfortunate because like realistically in practice, it does make more sense for stuff like that. Like it was a mostly offending card in Lexi. So obviously yeah. Lexi should pay for that. I, I fully agree with that. But yeah, there was, um, like Kel said, it, it unfortunately has the side effect of just being fiddly. Um, there was a concept for Commander. Yes. Because we I keep referring things back to magic. Um, there was a concept in Commander called Band as Commander. And there were legendary creatures that you couldn't have as your commander, but you could have in your um, your deck. Grizzle Brand. Grizzle Brand was, C- and uh, Braids. Um, Kakusha was my favorite. Uh, Cabal Minion. Yeah. 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 But uh, They're all there black, were they're all black f- creatures. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it. Black Degenerate. creatures just really good, apparently. Um, but yeah, so then they got rid of it, and there was a decent amount of backlash for them getting rid of it because it was them. The, I think the main sort of backstory or the main, excuse me, the main uh, reason that they decided to get rid of it, at least their supporting argument, was, mm. uh, oh, it was too complicated. It was too complex to have two separate ban lists for, for players. And I think the overwhelming majority of people said it wasn't too complicated, but that was also people who have been playing Commander for a while. Um, I think the vocal majority there were people who were most familiar with it. so. It's um, it's it's kind of tough to have to balance, you know, within your format. There's the two opposite ends of the competitive spectrum of the people who are just getting into it that don't read all of the articles that come out on fabtcg.com, uh, and then there's the people that go to events and they make sure that they know they're up and up on everything. They're consistently interacting with it, and you have to make sure that the decisions that you're making aren't necessarily prejudicing one side <laughs> over the other um so yeah i mean that's a lot of words to say that I'm, I'm pretty moderate on the issue it's it's kind of tough for me to to really say one way or the other which is better um it's... but i can see why they would want to make it a sweeping thing as opposed to uh here in this specific deck it... even though it feels worse <laughs> for flesh and blood it's compounded by the fact that we have two main formats that people play we have blitz and we have cc and those already mm-hmm. have separate ban lists and me exactly as, yeah and me as someone who is already super entrenched into flesh and blood um i actually sometimes still get confused as to what is banned in cc and what is banned in blitz yeah. because i was like oh wasn't that banned and they're like no it's only in blitz or no that's only in cc and when you add in the specific heroes that's going to yeah. be so much worse that you're like oh that's only banned in lexi cc but it's not banned in lexi blitz and you're like what well, i i don't know or yeah. like or like I that do... card is banned in all of the cc or just i don't know like i do remember uh and i'm glad that they made it but here's the thing i don't remember which one is actually banned they banned <laughs> sonata and um skeleta uh, Skeleta. they Skeleta, they yeah. banned one of them in blitz and one of them in cc yeah yeah then <laughs> i think they fixed it skeleta is now the one that's permanently banned and yes. sonata is is legal okay. regardless yeah. Um, but yeah, w- when it was one or the other, but not both <laughs> for a little uh, while, yeah. it was very confusing. I, I do want to say this as well. I think this is a uniquely paper card game problem. If it was a digital game, no problem at all, because the digital yeah. client would if handle telling you. Yeah, yeah. The digital client would handle all of that crap. Um, but since it's a physical game and only a physical game, I think it's like, if you have to bust out multiple spreadsheets when you're building your deck, that's too much. <laughs> that that's too much. Um, so that's my thoughts. That's my personal thoughts. Um, yeah, but that's that's what I mean though. Like, I, I literally was writing down that note as we were talking about it, and then you said, "Well, they already have a separate list for for Blitz and CC, so why not make it more complicated? Because, because they're already you, splitting it into two things. Because now you have four. <laughs> now you have four lists for every single hero. You have the regular CC list, the regular Blitz list, and then you have the 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 CC list for that hero. That's and fine. The, and that that's oh, too much. <laughs> every hero would have to have their own page. Like, ah, oh, just it's so messy. Especially no, like you know what. I, like 10 years from now when there's like eight ranger heroes you have to go look at every single ranger page to see if oops, if yeah. bullseye's banned in like riptide or like 
the fourth version of Riptide? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm about to make the nichest reference of all time, and it's for a game that I've never even played, but that I, I know about just cosmically. Um, if my card game isn't like EVE Online, I don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> Bust out those spreadsheets, let's go. Let's <laughs> yeah. Go. Yeah, you have to have yeah. like power sheets. <laughs> yeah. You have to actually have like accounting software to play EVE Online effectively. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I yeah, think but yeah on uh, on the on the resources page fabtcg.com resources rules and policy center card legality policy there is a uh, there is this article which says uh, classic constructed card legality uh, obviously living legend obviously you can't use those heroes obviously banned and suspended so there's obviously there's already banned cards and also suspended cards what does that mean if you're mm. a new player all they're, these things the al- already exist so what's what's the harm in putting in banned in lexi instead well, I what? my my point is just the same the same thing. Like it gets really yeah, yeah. like ten years down the road when the list is like 150 cards long and you have like cards banned in yeah. one ranger but not the other one. It's just it's just messy. Yeah. Like I'm like I'm saying though, I'm like I'm pretty moderate on this because I definitely see the argument on both sides. And for me personally, it's hard to make a a, a hard decision on either side because. <laughs> Because I'm I'm totally in agreement with As that like it feels bad that specific yeah. things get like I mean and I can actually rope Kel into this I know for a fact that I can make him see this side because when Ball Lightning got banned Ball Lightning was totally fine in Lexi I mean yeah. it's still a really strong card but it was not what it was in Briar not yeah. even remotely close yeah but, the whole um, snap the whole snapshot death dealer lexi cool combo we build just was like nap see you later that whole deck idea is gone because you can't use it in lexi even though lexi was not the offender it was briar yeah it, so, so it's yeah but it's like, i i can see how it feels with that because it does feel bad to have your hero uh I agree. suffer for the sins of another yeah yeah for sure <laughs> like like uh, don't get me wrong i totally agree with that i just think yeah. uh if it was a one-off thing that's probably fine but like i think long term that's not a good idea uh if you yeah. if you think your game is going to be here for 10 years this is not a this is not a good idea because you're you're gonna have a yeah. huge it's gonna be Yu-Gi-Oh, man like the, their ban list is so long <laughs> it's so so big like their ban and restricted oh. list and like Yu Gi Oh used to have the problem too, where they would have like, and maybe they still do. There was like banned, and then you had restricted two and restricted one. So you could have like, you could play with one card, or you can play with two cards, or you can play with like the full, full three card list. That was also very fiddly too, and it leads yeah, to let's see. feel bad moments where you're like, someone rocks up and they 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 play their endless arrow right, and they're like, oh, you can't play that endless arrow. That that's banned in Lexi, and they're like, wait, I thought it was I thought it was only banned in. Riptide, and they're like, no, it's banned in Riptide and Lexi, but it's available in Bri- and in in Azalea, and it's just like, this is feel <laughs> feel bad. I don't yeah, know. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think I think this could go around in circles with regards to that yeah. as well, because I've I've just I've just looked at another thing, and there is another caveat which says, okay, this is suspended until this hero becomes Living Legend. So that's another variable that you can yeah, add in that. there as well. <laughs> yeah, th- there's uh, that. So seeds of, seeds of agony is is suspended, so you can't use it until it, chain becomes living legend in blitz or whatever so there's, there's even yeah. more other things that you can add to this card legality thing um i guess so, I i'm just they already do that yeah yeah so there's there's, there's like loads of variables and obviously i'm just salty because uh the lexi uh nerf got azalea when azalea didn't abuse it that's 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 my sort of stance and uh obviously we got loads of uh, divided opinions in here and also agreements which is great for today's episode yeah. that's what we need <laughs> because because yeah like i said the the other side of it being complex and potentially um not as yeah, friendly messy. for 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 new players or people who just decide that they don't want to you know even read the card legality or thing if you take like, like that is a real five months off and come back you're like i don't know it's yeah. just yeah it's, it's it's just it's a very tough thing to have to do i think that the easiest decision is the one that they've already made of just saying this card's yeah. banned yeah, even yeah. though but it definitely does like i i think that your feelings of uh it being you know not necessarily fair i think are totally valid <laughs> no that's that's, so, that's true though i mean he's right <laughs> like yeah it, it, no absolutely azelia <laughs> got dunked on for sure like <laughs> double, double dunk because right. because she got 
she got the bullseye ban and then warmongers came out and, and now just... now you only have one azalea at the battle harden or whatever um that's right yeah like that that's a thing for sure um yeah okay so, yeah that's a that, that's, that's obviously <laughs> that's obviously uh obviously a negative part of the whole hero thing um yeah. so uh be interesting to see what people's thoughts are on that so leave a comment in the section below was what your thoughts are because that was quite a, a long piece um and with regards to potential negatives potential talking points i've got uh one more note on this if you want to address this as well absolutely yeah sure um i do want to say uh just because i wanted to figure this out uh while it was still being talked about um yeah this isn't how many cards are on the Yu-Gi-Oh ban list but it is how many words are on the Yu-Gi-Oh ban oh, list. No. it is currently 1300 words oh long. no <laughs> And that oh, wow. that is um, like the card type, the name of the card, and then like what limited status it's at. The last time I looked, it was like a, a massive list. The list was huge. Yeah, it is. I, I copied it into a Google Doc, and it is ten pages long. How many lines? Jesus. Does it tell you how many lines long it is? Uh, it didn't say how many lines. Oh bummer. Um, and yeah, I just copied the entire thing. So again, it has a bunch of extra words in there, so it's not thirteen hundred cards but uh it's a lot <laughs> you can mess. look it up for yourself dear that's, viewer. that's what happens when your game is like built on power creep and that's true like yep. that's, that's like not like knocking Yu-Gi-Oh. i think Yu-Gi-Oh players would 100 percent agree with that like that's what their game is it's, it's power creep and that's what yeah. some players like really get excited about they have all the power crep cards um yeah and just really powerful cards in Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah some of them are There's still like words on well uh, too, yeah. Oddly enough, some of the most powerful cards in the game have like very few words in it. Like draw two yeah. card, draw two cards. Pot of greed has three words on it. Yeah, one of yeah. them is a number. Yeah. <laughs> or draw three cards, discard two cards. Well, you know what? It's mm. kind of busted where everything just costs nothing, which yeah is That's true. Main, yeah. That's the main thing. So, you know, flesh and blood, good on you for having a resource system. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. yeah that, that my pit, my opponent the... isn't able to uh, dominated crippling crush me uh, turn one every game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> it's uh, flesh and blood has like two resource systems, which is which is interesting. I, I would I would, I would mm -hmm. argue that the action point system is kind of like a resource. Um, I would say like. It's kind of three things. Uh, I would say like action point and resource itself mm -hmm. and just cards in hand. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I would say uh, is, is also like akin to a resource system. For like so. the truest definition of a resource. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hmm. But um, uh, but yeah, sure. anyway, with that being said, that was my last interjection. Uh, as what was your last point you wanted to go over? Uh, well, before we before we move on to that, actually, uh, just comparing other card games, just so you brought up the Yu-Gi-Oh thing. Uh, I I only really I've only the only other card game I've really played a lot of is EDH Magic the Gathering Commander. That's pretty much all I've ever played really to to a to a massive degree. And there was just one ban list for that. It was just banned in general. Uh, when I was looking at it, it just says this card is banned in Commander. So what about other games? In other games, what banned lists do you have? Is there similar things where it's banned in a certain format or banned until something else is unplayable? Or is is it just Flesh and Blood that currently has this intricate banned list? Um, regular Magic has a very similar thing. Not banned until whatever, but there's like standard ban list, modern ban list, pioneer ban list, whatever the, yeah. the formats legacy vintage um it gets fiddly when you get into vintage because vintage also has restricted cards and restricted cards you, means you can only have one of them in your deck right whereas normally okay. you can have you can have four so like black lotus for example is restricted um that's the most complex it gets is is restricted um for magic then like i said there is per, per format uh every card game has a ban list here or there i generally don't like restricted lists um and by restricted i mean like having only one being able to play with only one version of the card um yeah. but whatever like i'm not a huge stickler on that that kind of stuff um mm -hmm. so yeah it, it, just want just want just want to get an idea of what the system was for others because by the looks of it this is fabs is the most complicated right it's, now it's 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 about the same. Like Flesh and Blood, it's about the same as like Magic. The only difference is that the Flesh and Blood has that one little added thing where they're like uh, banned until this. But for like actual deck building, that doesn't matter all that much because it's still banned, right? Like 
doesn't matter that it's banned yeah. it, it, until Chain hits Living Legend. It's still banned. So when you're building your deck, you don't really need to think about that. You're just like, okay, it's banned. Uh, same with like uh, the whole like suspended thing for Flesh and Blood. It's essentially banned. Uh, that's just their their way of saying it's banned, but they might unban it soon. Like, but what that what they could have done is just they 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 could have just said Seeds of Agony is banned in Chain. Yeah, they could have. I don't know. I because, don't know why they had Vincent to... can still use it. Can't can't she? Vincent can still use it to not as not as effective as chain because she doesn't actively get soul shackles which is the thing that abused it yeah so if if so if if it said banned in chain instead it would potentially have the same effect but it's still fiddly because like well it's like i said yeah. like yeah the more yeah. like right now it's would, would be probably less fiddly but like i said like 10 years down the road it could be gross um yeah, that's right um and uh with regards to uh the last point kind of goes on from that because it's about the heroes so what happens to the heroes as they rotate out or hit living legend so uh the note i made is if your hero hits living legend now what does lss commit to reprinting fan favorites we've had prism but what about chain from a character perspective rather than just the uh the the card pool that they represent so obviously hero is a uh, Heroes are uh, characters in that regard are massively fan favorites. Prism was a massively massive fan favorite because she's absolute angel waifu, right? Mm. So you know people wanted to play Prism and they had this whole card pool available to her. It just happened to be that Prism and Chain were just ridiculously powerful as well in the same vein. Um, but what happens to those characters? Do they try and make that a uh, a sort of priority to then release these new versions of characters that have these massive cult followings i'm going to use this because i obviously founded the azalea cult um i don't know what i would do if azalea if azalea living legend did i know i've got you know quite a, quite a good chance to play her for the rest of my days but if that <laughs> happened what would what would uh, lss do to service characters and fans of characters that are gone rather than the deck itself perhaps hmm I mean, that's an interesting question in regards to the specific characters. Because they have gone on yeah. record saying that they will eventually replace replace the heroes, right? So, like, eventually Oldham, yeah. like, for example, will get a replacement. We don't know what that replacement's going to look like, if it's going to be a new Oldham or if it's going to be an entirely new character. Um, mm -hmm. For some yeah, the characters... Card, it's the card pool, isn't it? The yeah. card pool they're concerned about being accessed. Yeah. Yeah. For some characters, lore wise, it doesn't make sense to have an alternative. Because, like, Prism, as far as I know in the lore, she's literally the only character in the entire world of Wraith that can use Arc Light. Like, she's yeah. the only light illusionist because that's what she can do. Unless, like, Shiana and I don't know. There's, there's a whole thing with the Shiana thing. But, um, that's right. Yeah. But, like, lore wise, it makes sense that they would have to reprint, like, make a new Prism. Um, which is why we asked on the podcast with Brian Gottlieb, I actually asked him why uh, Vincent and not a new chain. And uh, I can't remember exactly his answer, but it was more of just like they felt like doing Vincent and not a new chain. Like that's mm -hmm. basically his answer. Is like think, they, just, they just felt like it. Yeah, if I recall correctly, it was basically just Vincent fit. Vincent yeah. was... It, it, Vincent made more sense instead of just a second chain. Yeah. Um, which I definitely understand. And uh, there is actually a um, friend of the friend of the podcast and friend of mine, uh, Kaylee, hmm. um, yeah. immediately latched onto Bravo star of the show as soon as he was released. Like <laughs> before people realized he was broken. He's even. got good like, taste. Saw it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just like, I am in love with Bravo star of the show. And like, totally understandably uh, the hero himself. He's, awesome the amount of confidence that this man exudes oh it's just protruding um, it yeah absolutely yeah so it like she ended up sitting down she like workshopped the deck totally separately from all these people that were putting out these like excel sheets on like what your optimal ratios for all the different types of cards <laughs> were she was like no i just want to play this deck and like she still has i think she's working towards getting the entire deck foiled yeah triple sleeved uh in bravo star of the show <laughs> sleeves like so ready for this and i think we were talking a little while ago and she was like yeah it's been a long time like since bravo got banned it's been a long time since i've felt a connection to a hero like i did with bravo um so and exactly, it's something yeah. that is still not great i think she mentioned that she really likes teclavasen <laughs> but yes it's she, still not bravo she know? just really so, likes uh mustaches 
Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> she did refer to Bravo as big gay dad. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Def- definite energy going on there. Absolutely. <laughs> Love it. He is. Yeah. Okay. So what about the living legend format then? Because mm-hmm. that format literally exists so that these characters who are sunset can still shine. Like, Good so point, yeah. what do you feel about that then? Like, that's the whole purpose yeah. of the format. I I do really like the idea of the living legend format. Um, I, I think that it's like a totally reasonable place for these decks to go. Um, because, yeah, I'm really interested to see how full power chain uh, stacks up against Bravo. Because full power chain is actually like a very good deck. It's insane. Like, a, an insanely strong, yeah. very consistent deck. Um, but like... Bravo was also really strong. Are in the, are they in the same like world? Like it's it's really interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 only downside that I can see right now, which is actually, uh, it, it's really funny that it builds this way off of people's complaints about how the Living Legend system works. I think that the Living Legend format won't necessarily be interesting to play until there are more people in it, more more heroes in the format. Yeah, I know that I know that the um. Mm that the thing that james white said about the living legend format was you know welcome to wraith started flesh and blood with four heroes and that was it um technically ira but no we don't that's that's not real um but uh yeah started with four heroes and that's fine but like these are all the the heroes that live in the decks that live in the living legend format are ones that have been workshopped to death they are as optimal as they could possibly be um and so it's like it, it, it's there's there's more of an opportunity for there to just be a best deck i think the format is small enough that it can be solved realistically I, um yeah i i do want to so, see it though i do to that of, yeah to that no, effect, absolutely because like too. we actually have I, mean, I was i was thinking about this did we have an era where a one of the living legend uh heroes didn't actually have a chance to play at their full power and i think that's true i don't think either starvo or oldham ever got to play with awakening and awakening is an insane card jesus yeah Uh, it's one of the cards starvo Starvo did very specifically i remember that okay um it was a a ptq whatever it is called um but yeah i was it was the one yeah proquest um i remember it was the one that i was judging that went until like 10 or 11 p.m um there were i think it was six out of the eight top spots were all starvo and yeah i think one of them came down to awakening and i was just like yeah that sucks this this is miserable (laughs) if you watch back Uh long time feels like a long time ago where i was talking about like my top cards of tales of Ari, i was like awakening seems insane and i was like the only person saying it i'm like this card lets you tutor for stuff it's like insane um and uh Turns out, yeah, it's it's insane, and it was also you know promptly banned. And there's a handful of cards like that that I think I don't know. It'd be it'll be it'll be interesting to see because like the way I see the Living Legend format, you have super hyper aggro chain, but you also have like super hyper control like Oldham and even Prism, um, and then Starvo's kind of like this in betweeny kind of thing where he just does nuts stuff out of nowhere. Um, yeah, I, I want to see it. You might be right. You might you might just be like okay chain's just the best right or whatever is just the best um but I do want to see it I think it'll be interesting the same way that I think it's really interesting to watch uh vintage magic or like legacy magic mm-hmm. being played because it's super powerful and it's just really interesting and usually the, t- the games aren't that many turns but I still think it's really like fascinating to see it pop off to some to see someone do like a doomsday stack in, in like a vintage or legacy or to to see someone pop off with storm or something is always really cool um, no, that's a good. That's a good thing about where we're at at the moment. Is it we're still very, very early days. So even though these heroes and obviously they're going to be Hall of Fame heroes um, are all are all going to come back eventually. If the living, living living legend format does take off, there will be a point in time where we're going to have the same amount of heroes as we have now in CC in living legend format as well. <laughs> so that's going to become be a long time. It'll be a long time, but if if they carry on with it, it could certainly happen. So same with the. Uh, hmm. the archetypes and the amount of ways you can play a deck it's just going to constantly add more and more things to it which is going to feed that living legend system so you're, if if that does take off and you know all these heroes that have been sunsetted you're still going to be able to play them if that carries on hopefully it does i just had an interesting thought regarding that 
It actually might be a lot longer than we think unless they change the way the Living Legends system fundamentally works. Because as we have more and more heroes added to the game, more and more new heroes, the likelihood that any one given hero becomes Living Legend is less and less. Unless one particular yeah, more hero... More variants. Yeah, yeah, so that means the Living Legend format is going to grow a lot slower. Unless, of course, you have one that just a, that's a breakout that just dominates an entire season, right? But um, we, we haven't... Yeah. We haven't really had that since said Starvo, to be honest. Um, yeah. Because the last one, we have like Oldham and Briar, but like those are from Tales of Aria, which is one of the first sets, right? Um, I, it feels new to me because I, I'm, I've am i been playing this game for so long, but Aria is like, what, the the fourth set, the fifth set? We're at like 10 sets. Aria, Aria is also the um, WTF set, isn't it? It's like the what the hell happened? Rosetta, Duskblade, Oldham... <laughs> You know, Briar, Ball Lightnings, Embodiments, Pretty Triggering good. Multiple Times. Uh, you know, yeah. that set was just absolutely bonkers. Um, and it's, it's it's recognized as such. Yeah, all, all three yeah. of the heroes from that set are, like, nuts, right? We still have yeah. Lexi and Briar, and they're still, like, nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's it's kind of wild, looking back, how just on average how strong the cards in Tales of Aria were. Um, like yeah. it was like it is i think head and shoulders above most of the other sets that have been printed thus far <laughs> <laughs> hmm. yeah yeah it's it's very parasitic but yeah i agree cuz like you can't yeah. really use those cards in other heroes it's like you put them in those heroes cuz they're like all elemental crap yeah cuz there weren't any generic cards in tales mm. of aria i think i think it was just class and um class talented element. cards um hmm, if i recall to, correctly i'm pretty sure think. there won't there weren't generic cards i'm but, like there's there's always um, a like a, a key majestic generic if there are ma generics and i can't think hmm. of the key majestic one i think there were there were um common equipment that were generic there, but i don't think there were sure. any actual generic cards yeah yeah, um, yeah so there's like a deep blue and yeah there's a bunch of common generics for yeah. sure runaways but, ooh, <laughs> oh yeah a little runaway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah but no the uh tales of aria was just absolutely wild um yeah but yeah so in terms of sets like um like bright lights i think that having more options is really good um i'm interested to see how it affects um living legend for dash like even just regular dash if they decide to print more crazy specializations for uh data doll then i'm excited to see that too let's do it yeah um, just something that data doll is able to start the game with and it's like hey you have 18 intellect and you have 8,000 health <laughs> 18 intellect she, she's literally just just the robot um yeah. bill i would like to, i would like to um correct you there is one oh. generic card in tales of aria it is cracked oh, bobble actually. oh my god <laughs> technically mm, uh i've been i've been slapped down from my ivory tower <laughs> wow. so yeah yeah there, there's Savage. only ragamuffin's hat deep blue cracker jacks and runaways. That's it. And then there's crack bubble. That th so those are the only ones that are generic in the set. Um, yes, there's no, there's no there's no generic action cards, correct. which is yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I so, think I think I think I think they should dial back on powerful generics. To be honest, because so okay. it, you can. I yeah. think we can get into that with bright lights, because yeah, I, I want to ask you guys then that should there be a lot of generics and bright lights because. And this is going to tie into the whole thing of like um, players being interested in bright lights or not being interested in bright lights because it is only mech. So if it is literally only mech and you have no reason to buy no generics at all, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Because like I, I want to look at this from a couple different perspectives. There's obviously the, there's the player perspective, right? of whether or not you it makes you want to buy any of the set at all. And then there's the 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 Legend Story Studios perspective of is it good for them to print a set where like a per, a percentage of their player base literally is not going to purchase at all. And is it how much of that is going to hurt their business like as a company and as like, you know, a, a game publisher. Um mm. because I I I'm thinking about it on these like two axes and like I think the easy answer for me personally is just to be like, hey, play limited. But there's going to be some people like Bill doesn't like limited. There are going to be some people who just like, I don't play limited. 
I don't play mech. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm out. Like so I'm gonna pose the question to you guys. Like, what do you think about that in general? Like should there be generics well, or should it just uh, uh, Yeah. I'll start I'll start it off with the fact that we've we've probably mentioned it on the last couple of podcasts, and that is the expansion slot is the chase slot, isn't it? Because obviously you've got tunic in there in this in it's... this in this new yeah in this new set so i guess if you could still potentially as a casual just buy a box and maybe hope that you get a good pull in the expansion slot if you're not really interested in the in the set um you're that. probably not gonna you're probably not gonna you're probably not gonna do that but there's still the possibility that you can do that it's the same with like if they include you know like serialized cards or if they if they include sort of you know these chase rares that appear in these sets that might not necessarily be interesting to everyone that's kind of remedies that a little bit but um you should buy yeah, singles I'd, I'd, if 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 all you, you want buy... yeah if if all you yeah. want is a if is a expansion slot card you should just buy the single you should not spend oh, definitely. 100 bucks on a box to maybe pull it because i'm i'm trying to find the exact numbers those are rare there are okay yeah they are 1 in 15 boosters you get mm. less less than 2 of them per box you might get two of them in a box but you know remember flesh and blood booster boxes are only 24 packs right not 36 packs like a draft set for like magic or something like that 24 so one in 15 is not a lot you are going to get one and we also don't know how many different cards they're going to be like we don't know if it's going to be like five cards in the slot or like 50 cards right um yeah so anyway, yeah, and I, I, but I, I just yeah, I've got with regards to the fact that it's all mechanologist. There's no, there's no reason to put generics in there. You know, generics are, you know, it's one of those things to smooth over the the limited side of it. So you can have some cards that don't really adhere to the thing that you're trying to do. Or if you're like, worst case scenario, you can put the generics in to fill out a deck. You don't need yeah. that in a set which is all mech for limited. I don't think yes, for limited yes, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it it would be interesting to see because it it feels like if they wanted to keep things close as close as possible to mechanologist only, the generics that they would print would be very heavily mechanologist flavored, mm -hmm. um, like something like if you banish this, like tremors of Raphael or um, back yeah. alley break line or stuff like that, like things that care about being banished from the deck. Or yeah. um, interacts with if you have banished from your deck this turn, then X. Yeah. Obviously, there will be more um, opportunities, more avenues for that as they build out the um, the mechanologist identity. Like, like we kind of mentioned, there's going to be you know the the whole Iron Man dealy and whatever. But like items, like they could put generic yeah. items in the set. They, they already said there's going to be like 30 new items, so they don't all have to be mech items, right? They could be some generic items too. Um, that yeah. could be Which yeah be yeah exactly interesting yeah. to see um just look up dated all again i, just I would actually I keep forgetting what her text <laughs> i is. would actually be very surprised i'm pretty sure it's mech items only for dated all by the way it is yeah mechanologist yeah. item with cost two or less ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shame. but like i'd be very surprised if it's only all mech cards and i know some people are like oh it doesn't synergize with boost i think that's probably good like you don't want to like you don't want to have like a perfect boost in your limited experience. Like, I don't know. It just feels mm -hmm. like it takes away any of the risk for that mechanic, right? Uh, it just makes well, the that's just it just makes well, the mechanic the banish the top card, mm -hmm. go again. Um, yeah, but that's that, that's just the aggro deck, isn't it? In that format, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be the the arachne of the all of your cards have go again sort of situation. I know they don't. It doesn't say all of your cards have go again, but essentially they 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 might as well. You know, you're just you're just you're just doing the aggro thing, so I, w I wouldn't surprise me if, if if it still was all mech, the you know with boost. We'll see. Yeah, um, I, I guess we'll start seeing. We'll see. yeah, I do remember when I got to play Young Arachne in that pre-release or whatever it was, um, and my deck had, I think it was fifteen different sources of blood rot pox. Um, <laughs> nice. It was like oh, I wow. had like almost a full play set Love of it. infect, and then a bunch of the um, virulent touches. So oh, nice. it was like oh i'm gonna attack you with this thing that doesn't have um or no i, I was playing specifically um uh your your lady uh kel <laughs> azuri. Playing azuri? azuri yeah because i was i was flipping these things in and 
yeah, it was. I think I went three turns in a row of being like, "Oh, I'm gonna attack you with this thing that doesn't have an on hit," and they were like, "Okay, cool. I'm not gonna block it." And like, "Haha, virulent touch," yeah. or I am gonna block it, and then virulent touch. Ha ha. Um, nice. So yeah, that was fun. Nice. <laughs> nice. Okay, so I do want. So I do want to pose the question: whether they do or not, um, do you guys think it's good for both the consumer or LSS if they don't put any generics at all? Like, if it if it's literally only all mech, like. Is that even like a smart thing to do? It's bold. I think it's bold either way. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start and say I think this year has just been a year for them to remedy heroes that needed support. I think that's I think that was the play this year was to give Ranger the boost, then give Prism and Chain the Chism 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 and Chism Chism, Chism and Prane. <laughs> But um, but yeah, and then obviously we've got Mechanologist who hasn't had support in a long time. Maybe this is just the year of them saying, right, we're gonna just going to do this, and then we're going to do some other stuff. But then Brian said also there's no formula now, so we couldn't expect anything. Um, so uh, that could just be all all garbage as well. But yeah, yeah, it's... I will say um, from had... my perspective as somebody who has a, a problem, as some people might describe it. The draw of the expansion slot, even though it's one in 15 packs, does still exist and should not be understated. Like somebody just decides that they want to buy a box because they got some amount of tokens from their uh, from the local game store. Or they're like, I'm just feeling lucky today and I want to pull a spring tunic. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, hope in... I'm not alone. <laughs> Yeah, impulse buys. You know, if you can if you can bake in a reward for an impulse buy from a random booster, um, then that is that is good sales uh, tactics because they can still, albeit there's not much in the in the pack for them for their favorite heroes, they can still pull a tunic, which is still worth the impulse buy, and that game stores love the impulse buys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't... yeah, they sure do. <laughs> I don't have yeah. two minds of that. I'm not sure how consumer friendly that is, to be honest. Just pre- <laughs> oh, preying no, on people. No, I don't think it's consumer friendly. Need to gamble <laughs> because, absolutely. like I said, problem. Yeah, <laughs> I I think largely that excitement is gonna de- depend on how many cards are in that slot and how good the cards mm. are. Because if it's like exactly, yeah, here's a tunic, and then here's like, I don't know, like a ravenous rabble or something like. Yeah. You pull the rabbit's rabble as your one in fifteen chance, like good luck. But like, they but they did they, they did say that the the expansion slots, what was the thing they said? They said that they're using it to ex- expand constructed play. So I imagine these are gonna be new cards, but then tunic also goes against that statement that they've made as well. They said so, they said there were needed three different categories. Yeah, it was like needed reprints, uh, and then new cards and then lore relevant cards. Yes, yeah, those those are the three mm. things. Lore relevant right. cards uh needed reprints and new competitive stuff um all right so what so what else needs a reprint tunic what oh, what else would just talk would to anyone to re- you know, so talk to anyone who complains about the price of this game uh any of the good majestic generics so right. art of war cnc and enlightened strike um and then obviously tunic uh we just got a reprint of the crown which is another one that people want a lot um yeah I'm not sure what else is up up there these days, but yeah. But okay. like, I well. don't think they're putting all of those in this set. Like, in fact, the tunic might be the like reprint card. They might just have a bunch of new cards. Um, and maybe yeah. a, maybe, maybe, maybe a weird jank see. lore card like like Morlock Hill. And that's the other funny thing. If they have like cool lore cards that I love, but they're like jank playable, like like Morlock Hill. Also, yeah, maybe that's your one. Maybe that's your one card. Um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how this this thing plays out here but like yeah i do know a lot of people listening and i I read the comments to my videos there are a contingent of people who are like i don't care about mech and i don't care about draft so Hmm. i'm not buying this and i'm like that's fair right like i'm not gonna be like no you should buy this um and i personally i think it is hmm i can't predict the future I don't know if it's going to be good or bad for LSS. I think the set looks cool. I'm going to buy a bunch of it. But um, I yeah. can't help but wonder if this is going to be one of their lower selling sets because of that. Um, it's a, the first time I've actually seen people like preset, like being like, I'm not buying this set. Um, sometimes I've seen it like mid set. They're like, oh, I don't care about this set. I'm not buying it or, you know, crap cards or whatever, not buying it. But um, 
I've never seen it like before the set is even like starting to be spoiled. We've seen like five cards and they're just like, nope. Um, yeah, I guess that's the, yeah, that's, that's the casual issue, but also with regards to um, the people that want to play competitive competitively, they have to invest in this because it's part of the world's format, isn't it? They just have to, uh, draft, they just have to draft it or yeah, it's draft sealed. It. Is it sealed? Well, I think it's sealed, isn't it? I think it's, I think it's, uh, um, bright light sealed for world's format is or is it? it draft i don't know i, 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 I would assume not... it's draft because draft is more skill intensive but i don't know it could be sealed i haven't looked oh no sorry no i'm thinking of the calling in worlds is is uh is is bright light sealed that's what i'm thinking of oh, um yeah, sure. but yeah but yeah that's right yeah so so the people that are competitives still do have to invest time into drafting and learning the set even if they don't yes. care about the heroes because they have to do that because that's what they care about but for us casuals i guess we might want to play a bit of sealed some of us do some of us don't but yeah it's it's, it's going to be a strange one that's for uh, sure i'm also very curious on like the market on this like after like the single prices because it's like literally yeah. just all mech stuff and if if what you think uh, you guys are thinking is correct, if there's no generics at all, it's just literally all mech stuff. Like, what's that market even going to look like, right? It's mm. like when you when you look at any given set, like there's only going to be a, a couple cards for any given, you know, like uh, type, like a class or whatever that are worth anything. That worth it, yeah, exactly. It, yeah, I don't know. Like, and if people are opening this, like hand over fist to get those special. Um, you know, one in 15 expansion slot cards. I mean, there could just be a ton of the cards flooding. Um, so I don't yeah. know. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Um, yeah, it's going to be, going to be, going to be interesting. Maybe in a, well, in about a month or so's time. So in five or six podcast time, we're going to be speaking about it. So <laughs> probably, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm also curious to know people, you know, the audience's opinions on this, like just in general, I want, I want to know a couple things. Are you going to be buying bright lights? Um, and mm -hmm. if you are or aren't, why? Like, are you buying it mm -hmm. because you want to play limited? Are you buying it because you like mech? Are you buying it just because it's flesh and blood and you just want to play with the newest flesh and blood stuff? Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, that's me. I'm just going to, uh, I'm a flesh and blood diehard. And also, I think the it's really cool. And I made a whole video gushing about why I think the crack shuffle play thing is brilliant. Um, and I do. And I stand by that. I think it's. Um, absolutely yeah excellent. it's very good but um yeah. yeah i think it also does like you know we bring this back to the conversation i think it does highlight some of the problems inherent in like the the hero system um because it yeah. you know they're literally printing a set that might not be for someone um like at all and that's not just like a you know the whole magic thing where like oh this product isn't for you like this is more of like a this product literally has nothing that you want in it, and you know that ahead of time. That's right, yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm in very likely buying at least one case. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Uh, one case, man. I'll, I'll probably do my standard, like, four, or five, four or five cases. Yeah. yeah. Because, like, I I'm thinking about it. I'm like, for me personally, I do like mech, and I do want to play with the stuff, but it's a limited set, and I love limited. And... I probably would just want to play the crap out of this thing, especially with the crack shuffle play. I mean, that, that sounds like good content or e like easily facilitated content to just to ask like a friend, uh, like as or bill or like uh Steven or Ian and be like, Hey, you want to do like a crack shuffle play stream? We'll just, uh, buy Yeah. It's not self-contained, isn't it? Yeah. Just get like nine packs and we have like three completely different matches. Like that'd be super fun. You just like, yeah, just have at it. Um, so that's why I'm going to be probably, probably buying a bunch but um maybe less than usual actually now that i think about it because I'm, I'm probably not going to need like all that much and after after dust till dawn Duff, dust till dawn was a little rough for me i opened up some good cards but the fact that i, yes. I, I spent like a thousand dollars and didn't even get a full play set of the majestics was like mm. like crap yeah that's and that's, that's the thing in it? it if you're if you're not really part of that contingency that loves prism or chain i guess you just want to buy the the three of so you've got the play sets of the cards and that's it just so you can build the hero if you want to play it for whatever reason um but um yeah it's gonna be interesting to see how it all turns out and yeah let, let us know in the comments below as to what your thoughts are on this and what you know what what, what did you say for the audience to ask kel 
What oh, would yeah. you say? I just want to know if people are going to be buying bright lights and okay, um, or not. And then why? Like, like I said, like I'm probably going to be buying a bunch for the reasons that I said, but I'm curious if you're going to be buying them um, or, or if you're just going to skip out on it entirely, because I think yeah. that's like valid, like super valid. Mm-hmm. Like if you're not into it, then you're not into it. Right. And I'm, I would never advocate that someone buy something that, you know, they're not going to enjoy. Like, so if you don't derive any enjoyment from it and you don't think you're going to play it at all, I don't blame you. Um, yeah. And like I said, at the start of the show, that reminds me a lot of Legend of the Five Rings, where it's like they would put out sets that's just like, these are the three clans. And if you don't play those three clans, then you're like, what do you do? Yeah, I don't need to I don't need to buy this, um, which on some degree, some hand is I think is a little bit consumer friendly, but also is a feel bad for people who just want cards to play with. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so. yeah, that that, that 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 pretty much brings it to the end. It's a good segue because we're speaking to the audience right now. And there's a few audience uh, comments that I've made note of. And uh, one of these people is looking forward to this. Uh, this is uh, Dalin Levin. 8394 on a comment from a previous podcast saying hello from canada i plan on building teclo vossin as soon as possible so there is one person at least who's go, looking yeah. to build iron man um <laughs> hell, hell yeah <laughs> hell yeah brother so like, uh, no 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 joke i mean I, I, as a giant weeb i kind of want to get like uh, an, an altar of either dash or data doll or something altered to look like battle angel alita that would be sick oh yeah sick as yeah. hell <laughs> oh, brilliant um next comment comes from uh tam kablam again i'm gonna men- i'm gonna mention you again because you were well <laughs> happy that we read your comment out so i'm gonna read-, read out another one for you omg i nearly had a heart attack when i heard my name and past comment being read was not expecting that love listening to you three talk about anything and everything even if it isn't fab related so thanks for that comment i appreciate it yeah. that's uh very, that's very much appreciated, <laughs> especially again in times like this where there just isn't quite that much to really mention about Flesh and Blood. We so. actually right. we actually talked exclusively about Flesh and Blood today. Like we had a little bit of tangents here and there, but it was all like related to Flesh and Blood, right? Actually, so, yeah. The, all the stuff yeah. that I'm thinking about was before we even started like officially recording. So yeah, there that's you right. go. Now we're talking about yeah. Flesh and Blood again. It's a, it's a very Flesh and Blood <laughs> heavy episode. I think it was good good discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, uh, the tweet of the week came from Anthony at Salty Sea Cat 33, and he just posted when at Bill TSF calls Silver Palms stupid and then tagged Red Zone Road <laughs> and going and gaming as in that comment. And it's like, gasp, Squidward, and then SpongeBob like this with his arms up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, I, I did uh, respond to that. I love, I love Genus Watch You Need. I love silver palms. Uh, I got my uh, my cold foil of it. I pulled it, I think, on stream when um, I think it was me, Kel, and a couple other people were doing um, mm. uh, the Everfest. initial opening of Everfest. I got it. I was pumped, uh, mostly because I didn't have to um, spend the money on it necessarily, uh, not at least directly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that it's a really cool card. I think it's really strong, and I think it's going to be great in uh, PVE. Um, but yeah, for for it to be good in like 1v1, the upside for you getting silver tokens would have to be astronomical to have mm-hmm. it be the, the reason that you're getting a silver is that your opponent is drawing a full card. Yeah. Assassin Merchant Hybrid using the silver to buy back your equipment it's i could see that free design space uh lss brian gottlieb go yeah there it. you go brian gottlieb <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, i love silver palms when i'm playing valda and my opponent also is playing genus and silver palms that's when i oh, like God. silver palms <laughs> yeah and the bloody earth law bounty and seismic surge shenanigans that you can get off of it Oh, yeah. I want to punch people yeah. for 14 and I want it to cost me zero. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh. Fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, 
that's pretty much going to bring us to an end for Living Legends podcast uh, this week. Um, if you have any longer sort of uh, stories, comments, and questions, email us at the Living Legends Podcast at gmail.com. We'll read out the full story if you want to if you want to put it in there, or if you want to continue putting it in the comments and tweeting at us, you may appear on the show as well at some stage. Um, but that is pretty much it for today. I'll throw it over to uh, to Kel first to do mm. your things, even though you're seeing this on Red Zone Rogue anyway. But who knows? Hi, I'm Kel. Uh, some people know me as Red Zone Rogue. I like to make uh, videos about card games. You can find me at uh, youtube.com slash redzonerogue, as well as twitter.com. I refuse to call it x uh, slash redzonerogue, uh, as <laughs> well as uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook. Uh, also, I, I'm starting to upload weekly content to Red Zone MTG, so if you want to hear me talk about magic, you can go there as well. Um I'm going to yeah. try to, as as with most of my content, try to focus on things that I like rather than things that I don't like. But I have a feeling that I'm probably going to complain a lot more on the Magic channel than on <laughs> the Flesh and Blood channel. Um, not about a lot of stuff, but uh, in my video that I posted today, um, I go over my history with the game, um, why I quit, why I'm kind of getting back into it. And then I have a small rant about the house the Duskmorn House of Horrors splash art where there's the guy looking at all these images of himself, but he's wearing like a popped collar and has like this EMF reader. And I'm like, why the hell does he look like he's from the 1980s? I get that the set is supposed to be like 1980s horror set, but he just looks like he's like a dude who just walked out of Stranger Things. It's going to be weird to have him like just palling around next to like Chandra or something. Like, why couldn't they make him look like he's in world? Why is he? Anyway, you can look, you can expect that kind of stuff uh, over there. Uh, how about uh, how about Bill? <laughs> uh, hello, I am Bill from the Spike Feeders. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at Bill T, or you can find me on Twitter at Bill TSF. You can also find me on YouTube at the Spike Feeders Fab, as well as just the main Spike Feeders channel. Uh, like I kind of alluded to previously, I've played a couple of um, Commander games recently with um, a very it's all the way over there, but I have a, uh, a Shieldred oh, deck that I decided to put together. Uh, that's just a bunch of black cards, just a mono black deck. And then oh, yeah. uh, also filled in to film some um, some pre-con games. Uh, so those were really cool. Uh, those were a lot of fun. So if that's stuff that interests you, you should definitely go check us out. Awesome. As, as do you have a mono black deck? Yeah, I do, yeah. We should we should have yeah. a we should have a mono black deck off because I also have a mono black deck. Mine is Mari the Killing Quill, assassin rogue themed. Yeah, it's Jake. Well, we, we, we're but, also but we well, we, Jake. we should pop the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, we should probably do it right now because we're all wearing black t-shirts as well, black shirts. Oh, hey, I'm um, wearing a, so... <laughs> a, a fab wreck. It's like EDH wreck, but with flesh and blood. Yeah, like, they gave me this Brilliant. shirt that like Pro Tour. That Worlds, wasn't it? Might have been worlds, worlds. Isn't it? I don't remember exactly. Yeah, could be worlds. Yeah, yeah. I was furious because they didn't. They didn't give me one. I didn't know who I who I was. So, <laughs> <Really>? uh... <laughs> I didn't even remember that. They were just like, "You want a shirt?" And I'm like, the, "Yeah, sure." The, the, they just walked past me, look at me. It's like, oh, it's just, "Who's this mullet bloke?" And then just uh, carried <laughs> on. <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> What's this guy doing in the Hilton Hotel? Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, because I lost. Because I think we were standing with. Uh, I don't know. I don't think the professor was there at the time, but I think we were standing there chatting with like, like Brian Gottlieb, maybe like Tannen and, right. Fl and Flake and stuff. I think uh, it's just a Steven bunch was of... there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steven, yeah, Di Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and it was just like random British guy. Who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Who's that bloke? And, it, and I had like windswept hair because I just got a bloody scooter from my hotel through the middle of San Jose because that was my transport, an electric scooter, pay as you go. Speaking of speaking of eighties, man, as was rocking. I, I don't know if it was this was the time, but he had like this pink and purple like patterned pants. Like <laughs> that's right, yeah, yeah, man. That's why that's what I met James White in, and the first thing he said was, "Man, I love your style." <laughs> oh, that's so good. I uh, got it on video as well because Olivia. Olivia filmed the whole interaction for me. She was carrying yeah. the GoPro, bless her. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a good moment to capture. Um, yeah. But yeah, speaking of, speaking of my content, you can actually go and see that. I uploaded every single fucking clip to the uh, San Jose four-hour ultimate cut. <laughs> so all of those videos were just back-to-back -back on uh, on that video, I, uh, I which watched you can it. go and see if um, if you'll be so inclined. But yeah, I... Go Again Gaming is is changing a little bit. There's going to be lots of 
lots of different bits on there in comparison to just what I feel like uploading at the time. I do enjoy other things rather than just fab. So I'm just going to put it all on there going forward. So, but yeah, there, as I mentioned at the very start, there is going to be a daily fab series uh, starting at the beginning of this week. Uh, so you probably would have seen three episodes already if you tune in over there. Um, so yeah, stay tuned as to what that what that's going to be. Uh, and then on Twitter, on Go Again Gaming AZ over there as well. So that's nice. it, really. Excellent. I did watch his four hour supercut, uh, not all in one go, but I just kind of had it playing, and then occasionally it's good background material. Yeah, I would I would look over, and then as is scootering at like midnight through a weird sketch area and i'm like what the hell is going on <laughs> oh mate yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 i remember as well i had to abandon this is when i was pissed as well i was driving through i was driving through a random american neighborhood pissed out of my head driving a scooter uh it was so surreal it was so surreal um it was brilliant but then the scooter i ran out of credit on my scooter so i had to stop in the middle of this random american neighborhood and top up my my <laughs> scooter my scooter balance in the middle of this <laughs> random neighborhood just like what's what's going on here and then i just had to get on and go again it was just that was funny um I, i'm i'm surprised i i lived through that night uh, cause we got we all got pretty drunk on the last night didn't we um in yeah. the in the bar um I got yeah, I got, not... I got pretty drunk, but I left earlier than you did. Like I was like, "Hey, we're gonna leave," and you're like, "I'm gonna stay here." We're like, "All right, man, just yeah, uh, yeah, be safe." You know, that's right. And I definitely wasn't. I, I think I think Fluke and Box saved me that night because he went around and he was buying everybody liquid death, which is obviously water. Oh yeah, good um, stuff. so he he was just trying to sober everybody up who was getting way over the top, and I was one of those people that was way over the top. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think he yeah. saved my life that night. Bless him. Uh, but um, but good times nonetheless, and hopefully uh, all these good times will replicate again uh, later on this year in Barcelona. Um, so uh, yeah, should be uh, should be good. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this week. Thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next week. Do it all over again here on the Living Legends podcast. Cheers, folks. See you